Welcome to the Hamumu Halloween Home Horror Hoedown, the podcast where we watch scary movies so you don't have to. From award-winning to completely unknown, we take them all way too seriously. I'm your host, Mike Hommel. And I'm your host, Solange Hommel. Now warning, we use a ghoulish number of spoilers, so watch the movies first. Second warning, we don't know anything about anything, so don't take us seriously as we take these movies seriously. It is rare, I find, that a movie begins with a first-person self-immolation. That is, that is true. That is true. This, this movie just jumped right in, and it definitely had that feeling of like, I'm playing a video game of someone who is lighting himself on fire. Which, press X to light self on fire. Right? It's very upsetting. And why does the Sonata from 2018 open in this manner? I don't know. <laughs> I thought maybe it you would know. It was an artistic choice. <laughs> it really it it really was. It was a choice. I mean, there's I just feel like there's nothing about it that said this should be first person. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. It was weird. It was the prologue to the story. Yeah. In that, you know, we needed to know this horrific way that this man died so that we would then understand why his daughter didn't want to come home for his funeral? No, because nobody would tell her how he died for a while. Which I think if they hadn't had this scene, that could have been kind of suspenseful. Like, they keep not telling her and not telling her, and eventually she finds out. Yeah. I mean, I guess it was suspenseful for her, but not for yes. us. Because the sonata is the story of a violin player... Named Rose, because in movies, people are named Rose at a much higher rate than they are in real life. That is my hypothesis. I think there was a point when Rose was a much more popular name, but I think it was long before this girl was born. Which is sort of the way this movie is. It's it's a throwback. It's mm -hmm. like a 60s, not haunted house exactly, but like gothic family history bad things story yes and she like she didn't want to have anything to do with her father who had left her when she was very young and he was a famous um composer so like she even kept this from her agent who was all upset that he you know she hadn't told him who her father was but she just wanted to move on with her life and make her way as a musician without any of the baggage, good or bad, that, that he carried or yeah. he brought with him. He was going to be a new big guy in composing, but then he kind of became a recluse because he was working on a secret project. He was. Secret project with secret codes and symbols and things hidden away in his big haunted mansion. Yeah, haunted mansion, but not no haunting actually no, going no. on. No, not a really haunted mansion, just a pretend haunted mansion. Yeah. Pretend haunted with bookshelves full of Satanism documents, which was probably a bad sign. <laughs> probably. You know what else is a bad sign? What? So if you go to your estranged father's locked mansion, Mm-hmm. And then to get into the locked room and find a locked drawer <laughs> that contains a sonata that is locked with code. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you should take the hint. Don't play this song. But what if it's really good? But what if it summons the devil? Eh, that happens sometimes. It does happen sometimes. Especially with the rock and the roll. <laughs> Yeah, so she finds this song and immediately plays it. Mm -hmm. oh, the beginning of it, just a bit. I mean, but she knows, like she knows, like I knew it was a demonic song. She knew it was a demonic song, and immediately someone starts playing the demonic song, and I'm like, wh why? I think I think Take a beat. The premise of such tales is that they don't believe that it's going to actually be demonic because, like you or I, you would probably assume. 
that's not a real thing. I'll just enjoy this bit of music. Yes. I, you know, I, I was actually just listening to our podcast about Knock at the Cabin. You a big fan? Where, you know, our whole thing was like, there's no way we, there was never, there's never a point where someone can come to us with this premise and convince us that it's real. So I guess this would be the same thing. Like someone would say, this yeah. song summons the devil. And I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh huh. Let's play it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that because a fun part of this movie is the four secret symbols that show, mm-hmm. or is it five? Mm-hmm. Well, there's four symbols, and then, and then the, there's the fifth one that's yeah. all of them together. Yeah, but so, but only four of them actually do something in the song. They are in the song, you know, like a bass clef or something would be at the beginning of a line. And then, like, they take the song, well, her agent takes the song to, like, an expert who just looks at the sheet music and is like, hmm, this song sounds like this. That's weird to me. I, I guess it's a thing. I mean, people can do that. Like people who so weird. read music and like, are like very musically inclined. Yeah. Like they, they just picture the whole sound of it right off the bat. That's so weird. I mean, you, I, I believe you, it. You look at squiggles on a page and have pictures in your head. Yeah, yeah, but I have to, it takes time to go through it. I don't just like take in the page and I'm like, oh, there okay. it is. No, here's the thing. I think that the idea was that he had given him this music and he had like read through it you know okay. he had like flipped through it but well yeah when he flipped through it he found that it, he's like oh it's so good what good music except some of these passages are crap mm-hmm. and those passages had the symbols in front of them and so throughout the movie we discover that each one of them is like a code as to how you have to deal with that section to turn it into good music that part was so fun how like <laughs> The first one is the symbol of power, and they found it in the fireplace, so they had to expose <laughs> the uh, paper to heat because it was written, he wrote parts of the song in lemon juice, so it didn't yep. show up until heat. Like That's so cool. <laughs> I really liked the immortality one, which was found in the clock, of course, mm-hmm. and meant that you had to shift the time of the thing in order to make it yeah, work. With, That's cool. His clock that was off by an hour. Okay, I have a big problem with that, unless I'm not understanding it. You take a section of music, and she was like, oh, the clock's off by an hour, so like maybe you shift it by a measure or something. And all that would do is either put a pause at the beginning of that whole line or overlap it with the last measure of the previous line. And put a pause at the end. It's one or the other. I assumed that it was about the time signature and that it was like it was played too long or too short. It was written yeah. too long or too short or something, and you had to yeah. adjust that. Okay, that could be a thing. You'd have to like reinterpret it because it doesn't actually go into the boxes it looks like it goes into. Right. Which is where I had the problem. Because there are these four sections. One of them, you have to, you know, there were missing symbols. That one was easy. Like, they applied heat. Mm -hmm. The missing notes appeared. And like, okay, that makes sense. And then you just read that. You read what's there. Yeah. The shifting time one. Then there was, you have to reverse the thing. The symbol Mm -hmm. for for, uh, appearance was in the mirror. And you had to reverse it. Like in a mirror. Like in the mirror. And then there was the duality symbol, which was on the statue of the twins gallivanting in the garden. And you had to overlap the two sheets. I mean, yes, definitely people can read music very quickly and easily. And like the first time they see a thing of music, they can read it and blah, blah, blah. If they're good. Okay, but the first time you also, as you're looking at it, can be like, I'm playing this in a completely different time signature than what it says, so it doesn't sound anything like what it looks like. Or I'm playing this backwards. Well, here's what I'm going to give you, like you gave me the thing about him reading the thing. No, God. They actually didn't show us this, but they decoded each of these parts, and then they wrote down that section the way it's supposed to be decoded, and that's what they were using to play. I suppose. So there. I suppose. 
that stuff was pretty fun. And it, like each one was a really simple puzzle, but also mm-hmm. like you, you had to find that the symbol was on the back of this mirror by taking it off the wall. And then you, then you had to look at it and be like, okay, so the symbols on a mirror, that means something mm-hmm. and realize that means play it backwards, which is, it's a simple puzzle, but it's also kind of clever and nobody would be able to figure it out unless they thoroughly searched this house. Right. And it was like with the four different sections all being slightly different, even though they were all kind of easy, it's not like you would look at that music and just be like, oh, looking at this, I can tell I should probably play, play this backwards. Although honestly, backwards, backwards, I mean, maybe you could look at it <laughs> yeah. and be like, well... This is the exact opposite of everything else that, you know, all yeah. the other movements in this song <laughs> are played the opposite of this. Like, yeah. that might be obvious to someone who reads music. Seems possible. So through this whole thing, like, she's at this house, she's uncovering all of these things. We are also dealing with her agent, who, I mean, on one hand, is like the only person that she has a relationship with because she's yeah. cut herself off from everybody on the other hand, is not someone that she seems to like or trust very much. (laughs) Not really, no. And like, at the very beginning, you know, she's basically just, eh, I'm dumping you. Like, we're done. I'm breaking up with you as an agent. Yeah. Like, we're not working together anymore. You're holding me back. Like, she's vicious to him. I mean, granted, she did just find out her estranged father died. And then he spends the whole movie following her around, First trying to protect her and then trying to turn her into a tool to open the portal to hell. Yeah. Because the first time he hears three notes of this song, he's possessed. And for the rest of the movie, he's like a willing servant of the song. Yes. Yes. Which that didn't happen to her. Well, here's the thing, though. He, He went to the, like, friend of her dad who was yeah. still alive, he went and like that friend knew what was going on. He had been in on like, this is what we're, we're, we're creating this thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that he did something because then at the very end when she, cause it turns out, you know, she's the final symbol. She's all of the things put <laughs> yes, together. The combo symbol. She's power, immortality, appearance, and duality all together. I guess. Better symbolism and everything, by the way, than knock on the cabin. Knock at the cabin. Better set of four things. Better set of four things. <laughs> so she's all of these things together, and she's supposed to finish the sonata, and then she goes and like, that's the denouement of the movie. Yeah, is she just got, has to freestyle it. <laughs> she takes it. No, she's an artist of her <laughs> in her own right. Um, so are freestyle artists. <laughs> okay, true. But she goes and she plays this to you know a full concert hall, and her dad's buddy is mm-hmm. like. In the front row, la la. doing like the uh, the Burns mm, <laughs> fingers in front of his face kind of yeah, thing. He, he's excited to get to see the devil. Yeah, that's the shocking twist ending, I guess, is that she's out there doing the concert. Because, okay, that's the ending of the movie. And I found it disappointing. And I have problems with it. But also, I can't really disagree with it so the agent forces her to do the song he's like i figured out that the final symbol means you have to finish the song because you're the rest of it because the symbol was in a rose on the Mm. picture and Mm -hmm. she's rose Mm -hmm. you see name was important that's why they named her that Mm -hmm. so he makes her play the song but when she gets to the part well probably like halfway through the song she's into it like she can't really stop anymore and she's possessed by it basically and she finishes the song by herself and you know it's just what comes to her is the rest of it because that's the magic of the song and it's just like that happens a demon comes and murders her agent and then we cut between that and the actual concert that she's having later where she's gonna play it in front of a crowd and probably end up killing all of them except maybe mr burns yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I guess she's bringing about the end times at this point. Like, yeah, that kind of thing. And, you know, like, that's that's a good ending in the sense that, okay, cool, she's ending the world, great, we're all fans of that. But, <laughs> I don't know, it's just unsatisfying that just, like, after all this, mm-hmm. what we come to is just that 
she plays the song and Mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so hard because in horror movies, like you either have to have a positive ending, like have a happy ending where the hero wins, which then is sort of like, is this even really a horror story? Or you have to have the bad guys win in the end, and then it's just like, oh, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> yeah. Evil wins in the end. Like, I don't know. Yeah. And I, you know, I've seen both of those kind of things that aren't disappointing. Like, they go somewhere, and this one just kind of felt like, oh, she just played the song. Yeah. Like, maybe she could have played the song, and the demon comes, and she has to struggle with the demon or something. But no, she's just has become a willing servant of the demon. So we're yeah. done. I don't know. Yeah, it, there wasn't a whole lot there to it. I think it was it was a fairly basic story in that yeah. sense, which was fine for what it was. It just, you know, if you expect something bigger and more complicated or twistier, that's that's not what's going on there. Speaking of something bigger, her father, we come to find out, has a secret room mm-hmm. under a church mm-hmm. in which he tortures and kills children to record their screams. So Because that's that's the exact sound that he needed. That's great. Yeah, he had to get them to just the right pitch. Yeah. It was that was upsetting. Like there are not many things that happen in horror movies that shock me or where I'm like kind of stunned by what's going on. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while there's something. There was a movie that we watched a couple of years ago. The twins, maybe? The, they were twin boys, and, like, they torture their mom. Oh, it was, it like, was super bleak, and it was in a different language. German. Yeah. it w- That one, like, there were things in that movie that had me jaw dropped open. Yeah. I think that I was can't believe this Good is Night something. Mommy. Yes. And where I just was like, I... I I can't believe this is happening. Like, I can't believe somebody came up with this in their head and then was like, I know, let's (laughs) Let's make make this on screen so people have to see it. Exactly. The idea that he tortured, that he kidnapped children from the local village and tortured them to get the exact right tortured sound. Like, for some reason, I mean, when I say it, like, that doesn't sound that, like, unusual it doesn't sound good no i mean lots of things in horror movies don't sound good but this was definitely something that made me go oh yeah i think it was it was pretty dark yeah and uh it did kind of feel like there wasn't enough discussion or upset about it but i mean she was she wanted to call the cops she comes running into the house and her agent is there and she's like there's he's got a torture room where he's tortured, where he tortured and killed children. I've got the tapes, and he just keeps stopping her and going, "Stop! Tell me what's happening!" And she's just explaining it clear as day. And he's like, "No, no, you have to calm down. Stop and just tell me what's happening." Right. It was really frustrating. So that that was very frustrating, and that guy, like, yeah, he was he was all over the place. I mean, it was the possession, I suppose, but I, I, I sort of feel like the whole possession thing, it really depends on who you are underneath. Like, if you're a really good person and, de- and a demon takes control of you, <laughs> they don't have the same impact as when you're kind of a garbage person and then a demon mm-hmm. takes control of you. And it's like, oh, this is a comfortable skin. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to take much effort to make you try to kill this girl. <laughs> yeah, I um, guess so. So that was that was interesting. But going back to what you said about like there wasn't enough concern about it. Like there were multiple children missing from this village. Mm-hmm. And when she talked to people, like when she went to the bar or convenience yeah. store or wherever the heck it was that she went <laughs> and she was like re- she reveals who she was. Everyone kind of had Okay, so maybe it was because it was in France. And that was influencing my, like, what my brain was, how my brain was processing it. But I had this moment where I was like, is this some kind of weird horror remake of Beauty and the Beast? (laughs) Because Rose goes back to this little provincial French village (laughs) where she talks about how she's going to go live in this big house on the hill. You know, she, (laughs) like, mentions who her dad was and everyone's like, 
<laughs> oh, him. And they all get this like weird, suspicious look and like nobody wants to talk to her. And it featured the clock with the symbol on the back, which yes. even was like the right shape. Yes, it was. It didn't <laughs> didn't sing us a song, though. Well, in a way, it, <laughs> it helped us, it helped make us a sing song. the song. So like there were some like weird, heavy Beauty and the Beast overtones in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, even that the fact that her name is Rose yeah. is interesting. I told you, they're all named Rose in movies. Uh, well, but Belle's name is Belle. But That's she, a good you point. Know, there's a whole Rose theme thing. You know, it's a magic Rose is what's keeping Beast. Yeah, there's and a, a whole thing sonata. about Rose. Yeah, yeah. And a singing teapot. Yeah, which both of them had. But it was like, it, it just was weird to me that the villagers clearly suspected that her dad had something to do with all of these missing children or, you know, that they were like that, that dude is creepy. But at no point did anybody like follow up on that. Apparently they were just like, "Mm, it's too bad. There's a weird old guy murdering our children. (laughs) I Mm. mean, they were, they were tired. (laughs) Yes. They looked like worn out old people. Yeah. I did have a lot of questions at the end. (laughs) Why is Charles so tall today? That was one of them. I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. So, right, when they're having that confrontation at the end, and she's like, her head is like basically pointing straight up at the sky (laughs) so that she can talk to him. He's like towering over her. They were both normal-sized people to begin with. Maybe it turns out that like he actually is six and a half feet tall and she's four feet tall. And like throughout the movie, they used apple boxes to make it seem more normal and... (laughs) They just didn't in that scene. I mean, yeah, it was, I mean, it was done for effect, obviously, but it was weird to me. I'm like, he was never that much taller than she was before. (laughs) Yeah. Other questions I had. How is she a pure, uncorrupted soul after all these years? Yeah, I don't know. She went off and lived in wherever she lived, London somewhere, England, I don't know. She's a grown adult. Yeah. I mean, you don't know what she's been up to. Or not been up to. I mean, that's my point. (laughs) Maybe she's not been up to things, is my point. She was pretty sour and bitter for someone who was pure and uncorrupted, (laughs) is all I'm saying. She did seem a little corrupted by the world. And then uh, Rose conjures the devil to kill Charles? Yeah. Dead ghost kids help? Like, I I was just putting question marks at the end of everything, because I didn't understand why everything was happening the way it was. Well, I was totally fine with the demon coming in the window and killing Charles. Like, that was fun because Charles got to get killed, and he was clearly not a great guy. And also, it was her, you know, playing her sonata and Mm -hmm. summoning the demon, Mm -hmm. which obviously wouldn't go after her, because she was doing the song. Oh, no, that demon was definitely there to protect her, and she was just like... That all made That's sense. That's the guy who's harassing me. But yeah, the ghosts of the tortured kids were involved, and maybe they were like trapped, so they were like part of the whole thing. But also, maybe they were just there, like going help us. And <laughs> she, I mean, didn't. they looked awfully angry. <laughs> yeah, she she just summoned the demon anyway, the one that was resulting from their screams. So lucky yeah. them. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's what the base is that you put that demon on top of. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. Um, and then my final question here was just. Credits. Conjuring the Devil? And I don't remember why I wrote that. Were they playing some kind of classical music sonata thing over the credits? That might be it. That might have summoned the devil. Well, because, you know, the whole movie is about playing the song to summon the devil. And then I'm like, oh, so now are we, is this the song playing over the credits? Is the devil coming now? At the very least, she did play that song in the climax of the film. So I think we actually summoned the devil by watching this movie. I mean, probably not, though, because really anyone who was making this movie wouldn't include the actual sonata that summons the devil. This is just just a tribute. tribute. Yes. Yeah. Couldn't remember. (laughs) The the, the, the (laughs) The most evil song in the world. (laughs) The devil summoning song. (laughs) So this is a tribute. (laughs) Okay. And that makes sense because it's a work of fiction. Yeah. This is not a documentary. Yeah, exactly. This movie is done in the style of a slow burn thriller. It's, you know, solving a mystery, looking around this creepy old house, holding a candle while you walk around in the dark, all that stuff. And so it feels like that, 
But it's a short movie. I think it's an hour and a half. And it's actually really fast paced. Like they'll discover something. Then two minutes later, they've discovered something else. It just moves right along. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed that. The quick pacing while at the same time feeling like, you know, slow burn, creepy, depressing movie. And I also as we discussed, enjoyed the uh, the puzzle of the symbols. That was a lot of fun. It was like an escape room. Who doesn't love that? But also was disappointed in the ending, as I mentioned. I don't know what I wanted, but that wasn't it. I know that. So I hate to keep giving this number out. And I'm tempted to raise my score just so I don't. But I feel like this movie deserves three and a half Hobbit holes out of five. Because It's not quite up there with the fun fours, but it was enjoyable and kept me interested. It's a good movie. Not great, but good. Yeah, that's fair. I I agree with everything that you said. I think it was atmospheric is the it note that I made. It was indeed. I think it was that gothic horror kind of thing coming in. And it really, the whole thing felt like a gothic horror short story. Like when we got to the yeah. end, I was like, oh, that kind of just wrapped up like a short story does. Yeah, that makes sense. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot going on. It was just like, there's this little bit. We're going to tell you the little bit and then we're going to move on. And we don't care about how this impacts the rest of the world or anything because now we're on to a new short story. And, and I like that. I appreciate that. I mean, it wasn't the kind of movie that's going to stick with me forever and ever and ever, but also it was entertaining and uh, kept me interested through the whole thing. So I am going to actually give this four Hobbit holes out of five. I agree with you that that feels a little high. Like, I don't know that I would call this a four movie, except that we've given so many threes and three and a halves to movies that I felt were much more mediocre in a lot of different ways. Yeah. That it doesn't feel sa- fair to give them the same score. Can I revise my score? Uh, you can always. It's your score. What do you I'm gonna do? I'm going to share the four Hobbit holes with you. Okay. All right. Okay. Four and four. Yeah, I mean it was it was a good watch. It wasn't anything special, but I would recommend it. I'd tell people to watch it. Yeah, I think it was kind of enjoyable. And the puzzly nature of it was fun and mm-hmm. you know, as far as um like production values and everything goes, I thought it was it was good. There wasn't anything that super stood out to me like, "Whoa, this is mind-blowingly amazing." Yeah. But also there was nothing about it that detracted or distracted me from just being engaged in the story except for where charles was suddenly a foot (laughs) taller than he had been before yeah that was a little distracting that was the demon inside yes you got to make room for it somehow got to stack it's like it's like raccoons in a trench coat yeah (laughs) yeah fight the horror of a world gone mad and just a quick hot political tip um, this week, based on this movie and particularly how Charles the Agent seemed like he was a really good guy, seemed like he had her best interests at heart, and then by the end was <laughs> definitely being driven by his own need for fame and power and money and all of those other things. Like he he threw her over for his own benefit. Yes. Immediately. You could see it happening as he it was revealed who her father was and that there was an unfinished sonata by this famous composer and he was like we could make money off of that like right away. Yeah. So that ties to my hot political tip which is just Make sure you know who is pushing what agenda and why they are pushing it. When you're looking at the news and you're looking at different political things and, oh, so-and-so is saying we should vote yes on this and vote no on that, they're doing that generally because there's something for whatever vote they're pushing in there for them. So just know who is it. And why are they voting the way they're voting? Or why are they standing on the House floor and suggesting that we should not have this vote or we should not have this amendment happen? You know, and they're saying one thing, protect the sanctity of our government, when in fact it means something entirely different. That reminds me of, it's tis the season right now, of proxy votes, 
All the mm. stocks that we own send you, you know, shareholder voting proposals. And I go through them and I just, here's the secret. I vote no on everything the board set recommends you vote yes <laughs> and yes on everything they recommend no. Because but, <laughs> boards of all of those organizations are out for something other yes. than protecting the planet. But the thing is, at the bottom of all of those are the... Uh, are the things that shareholders have asked them to put on there. You know, they, they've gathered together and had a meeting or whatever and kind of forced, them, forced their hand to put this proposal on the ballot. And the proposals are always something like, give a report on the diversity of your hiring, things like that. It's always give a report on something. It's something completely harmless like that. Yes, it probably costs them 10 grand or something to do this report, mm. but that's a drop in the bucket to these giant companies. Mm -hmm. So why, why not? And yet they always say, no, we are against this. Don't support it. And I always say yes, because let's do it. <laughs> but if you click through to the actual voting materials, you'll see the like explanation of why they think you should vote against it. And it's so stupid. It's stuff like, we have always been very diverse in our practices, <laughs> and we're very supportive of all these communities. So we think we should vote no on this. Like, so that doesn't some, change the yeah, fact. We've always been great. We don't see any need to actually tell you about it. We don't have to measure how great we are. We yeah. just know it. And it would be bragging. So let's not do it. Yeah. And that is a great example of something you shouldn't trust. They have yep. a clear ulterior motive. And what they're saying doesn't even make sense when you think about it. Think about who it is, what they're saying, and what they get out of it if you do what they want you to do. Because there's always something. And, and that's true in all directions. Like that's, I'm not saying that bad guys do that and then good guys are not doing yeah. that. Like everyone is doing that. But you want to know like... Okay, so this person is trying to convince me to, you know, change to a a less thick kind of toilet paper. <laughs> like, what's the end game here? Like, how is this company benefiting from me making this decision? And, you know, that sort of thing. So just pay yeah. attention, dig deeper, think. And use less toilet paper. <laughs> that too. All right, that's that. But you're going to need more toilet paper next week when our movie scares you quite a bit. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. That was ridiculous. Terrifying film coming next week. Okay. Blow your mind. I don't know what and movie it is else, yet. Apparently. It's going to blow your underwear. <laughs> so we'll see you next week, everybody. Bye, everyone. Don't forget to call your elected representatives. You are writing demonic symbols in there, <laughs> including a dancing triangle. <laughs> <laughs> He's like hip hop triangle. <laughs>